Jody Brunning in our ongoing series. Here we are, dedicated to the cause, early Sunday morning. Thank you for getting up early. Um, congratulations on your work in the documentary Silenced. A lot of people I talk to are talking about that documentary. How's it been for you, the feedback? Oh, the, the feedback's been amazing and I was speaking to the director the other day and she said, well, the main complaint was audio and if it's a technical thing, you know, it's showing that people that have struggled to find words or struggled to understand because, because we haven't seen appropriate representation in the media, it's really resonated with many, many, many people out there. It's very good because it's showing the suppression too of of important voices as the COVID response was rolled out. And today our subject is suppression in another arena and a crucial one for 2023. It's the suppression of balance in a by-election. Tell us how you want to approach today's subject. It's the it's the Sue Gray involvement, isn't it, in Tauranga? Well, it's more than that. It's the minor parties. It's how we how we look at um, all the candidates in an election, and we let all the candidates have have some sort of voice. Now we know that the um, AUT Centre for Journalism, Media and Democracy, JMAD, have just released the fourth trusted news. Um, in Aotearoa New Zealand report. And, and what they said is that general trust in news declined from 45% to 42%, which is a downward trend that was evident in 2020. Now in 2023, um, the trust in news people consume themselves. So this is social media, this is what friends are sending them, um, increased from 52 to 53%. Now, that survey also asked about news avoidance, and they found news avoidance in New Zealand is at a, at a high level. It's at 69%. And my observations um, over the Tauranga by-election, what happened to the minor parties, they were firstly, so I want to talk about two different things. Firstly, they were, the minor parties were actively excluded from the debates. And, of course, those debates were then presented in the national media as if it was only three people. So these three people were Labor's Jan Tanetti, um, National Sam Uffendale, and Acts, um, oh, Luxton, sorry, I've forgotten his first name. Um, and then there were five minor parties, the New Zealand Outdoors and Freedom Party, New Nation One, pa One Party, Legalised Cannabis Party, and the and New Conservative. Um, and there were three independents as well that ran. And we didn't see these voices in the mainstream um, legacy media. They were silenced. So I want to talk about the silencing through the exclusion from the election debates. But then I want to talk about um, Sue Gray, the lawyer Sue Gray, as a, as a case study in the way she was, I would say, defamed by... Um, particularly News Hub. So I hope we get there today in our short talk. You know, Gray's a, you know, she's she's a politician, she's a lawyer. Now, I, I looked it up on the, their website. She's got a, a degree in microbiology. She's a, got a degree, I think, in was she law with honours, and then she's got another degree in biochemistry or something like that. Like this, this is a woman that has, has you know, she's she's been working across science and law for many years. So one would think she might have something to say, but that's the second part of this, this talk. So I hope we get there. The Sue Gray story exemplifies everything you want to say in the first part, which is about the exclusion of voices in our elections. This went back, I remember under the key years, when suddenly on TV One, they said, we're only going to have the major parties on one night. And then I think it was lost in the weeds. We'll have the minor parties. What was it, a Friday night? Nobody was watching. And I thought, that's very anti-democratic. But, of course, we had no idea that Key and then Ardern would be part of rolling out of something much darker across New Zealand. I interviewed in local body politics in Wellington local elections years ago when I was in the uh, a Wellington television station. I interviewed something like 14 people. And I was nominated for, what was it, the Qantas Media Awards then. And it's perfectly doable perfectly doable. It's an exciting debate. You have to be really on your toes. And the, 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 yes, the interlocutor has to really be able to know his stuff or his stuff. Why are they doing this, Jody? What is going on? Why are they making only the main parties on one night? 
Well, I think this discussion should be about, instead of asking that question, this should discussion should be out because it's a very short one about what happened so, so, so people can understand I, because I, I don't know why, you know, why. So I'm not going to answer that, but I'm going to just put the fa- present the facts of the matter right? and see what people think about that. So on 18th of June, there was a parliamentary by-election in the Tauranga electorate. The winning majority at the end of it was by 6,000 votes. There were 51,700 people enrolled um, and 20,900 votes cast, 40%, only 40%. And so what we saw with these, you know, 12 parties, we saw these election debates at the Tauranga Business Chamber, at Sun Live. Um, Then there was a news hub, you know, a media in the news station. There's one at Waikato University and then the Matua Residents Association. Now, the Matua Residents Association do this every election. They invite all of the candidates. And this was the only, only debate where everyone was invited. So... What we saw was the first one, the 23rd of May, was Toronga Business Chamber at Trinity Wharf. The minor parties were not invited. And now I started speaking to Sue about the the behaviour, you know, into this because I was very curious about this. So she was refused entry to Trinity Wharf, to the Toronga Business Chamber. Then we had the 24th of May. The next day, I I believe there was a Sun Live at the Sun Media offices. So we had there Uffendale, Tunetti, Luxton and Hollis. Now, Hollis, it was from a minor party, um, New Nation. At the end of it, he was awarded maybe a third or a quarter of Sue Gray's votes. So he wasn't the most popular um, minor party candidate from the get-go, but he was permitted. Sue Gray was refused entry at that one. Then we had the 8th of June 2022 News Hub Nation in the studio. The minor parties were not invited. And, of course, that one was circulated um, across New Zealand. So, you know, the the and, of course, the Green Party did not put up a candidate in this election, so it was just those three. It was just Labor Act and National. Um, and, of course, Tenetti was already in. So it really was a competition between Luxton and, not, not Luxton, Luxton and Uffendale, really. That was all. And we know, of course, that Tauranga has been a, a national seat for a long time. So that was the News Hub Nation, 8th of June, 2022. Then the 9th of June was the Matua Residents Association. Eight of the tw- Everyone was invited, eight of the 12 candidates in- attended, and that was a full house. People wanted, the public, civil society, wanted to see who were the candidates, but they were not privy to this. And then, uh, apologies, the, f- the final one was 14th of June, 2022. It was the University of Waikato candidate debate. That, um, we could all c- go and watch this. But once again, the minor parties were not invited. Now, after the other four debates where only one had, had included everyone, I, uh, Gray was absolutely sick and tired of being excluded. Remember, this is a lawyer. She's 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 a judge's disbarred or a judge disbarred. She's 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 stopped you know salmon farming in national parks. She's she's and she, I believe she has she has conducted and she also always conducts herself with the utmost um, respect for the law. Um, for the process of law, and but she is also a politician, so she's she has a very interesting role to to play in society today, um, and she's always been interested in where technology butts human health. So that's why she's always looked at um, taken on sort of pesticides, pollution cases. She's been that sort of person that um, small business will approach, you know, medium-sized business or just injustice in local communities. So that's the sort of person this person is. And I personally met her maybe 10 years ago because of her work in the courts with pesticides and so on. So I need to say here, a case like Baby Will, she had many, many other things calling on her time. She dropped everything. She will help people who are struggling. And my goodness, we need that at the moment. So she is beloved by many corners of New Zealand and has a very high profile, including the mainstream media, the government paid media going after her and decrying her constantly. So we'll put that aside for now. 
So what happened in that final debate, in that last debate? By the time at the University of Waikato candidate debate, um, minor parties were not invited. Gray expressed her frustration at being excluded. And so she was openly standing up saying, why aren't we included? Why are we left out of this? You know, this is a university apparently in a free and open democracy. And, you know, I listened to that debate and the, the dean or the to I see Dean who was there expressed this frustration at education in New Zealand failing about our levels declining about this that what we've got the quagmire with you know the educational system is finding you know and and there were no there was nothing there you know we they had Tanetti who's an educationalist there it was it was a really boring debate and I wished there was you know there was someone different and of course when you don't when you exclude when you exclude three quarters of the candidates which is what all these elections have three quarters of the the debates have excluded three quarters of the candidates I mean to me that is just crazy irony and so as 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 an egg farmer said to me he said how do you how do you know where the middle is like how do you know where where the middle ground in society is if our mainstream media and and all those powerful interests are actively excluding three quarters of the voices in an election campaign i mean the precedent this sets um for the upcoming election is remarkable and dark. And it was a rhetorical question. Why do you think they're doing this? I think many of us realize it is as with media, only certain voices will be allowed. Voices that do not agree with what the government dictates is the way that we will go forward in views are, are to be deemed dis and misinformation. Ipso facto, same deal politically. Those extremists, were were some of these people referred to in, in the debate write-ups as sort of more fringe, more to be uh, um, extremists? Because even that can colour the way somebody approaches listening to someone in a debate. Well, they, well, it's really interesting because the second part of this talk that I'm about to go into, knowing that we've got a very short time, actually addresses what I, I think was it was profound misinformation, but I think it was defamation. I think that they have defamed Gray at least. And and what they've done is they've patronized. They've they've kind of, you know, they they made the minor parties look silly. So they took the good quotes from the major parties, the West sort of powerful and great, and and then they took the controversial um quotes, the quotes that would other, that would put those minor parties over in the, oh, we, we don't really want, want to bother them. You know, they, they othered them with, so it was quite patronising. So only the briefest quote for, so so I, can I describe what we saw with, you know? Very much, very much. What was that, Jodie? So News Hub, there were two particular um, releases um, by News Hub and um, one was June 4th, 2022, and one was June 11, 2022. And, you know, so I've just talked about, you know, like, like so Gray is, I see Gray as pro-government. She's walking into courts of law. She's always respectful of judges. She's she's respectful of the, you know, the process of law. So we had the News Hub coverage, which advantageously highlighted 25% of the candidates. So the, the June 4th one showed ACT National and Labor candidates at a chamber at the at the business chamber event that the others were excluded from. So they presented the platform that they were running. The piece made no effort to disclose to the public that the minor, you know, minor parties were excluded. At that same time, Sue Gray was interviewed at length by Connor Whitten. But they saw in the in the in the replay on TV, they saw her talking, but they never gave her a voice. You know, the, just that the the metaphor there was quite amazing. And then they referred to Gray as the prominent leader of the anti-mandate protests at Parliament. You know, um, so and of course this is you know June fourth, twenty twenty two, where we, where there is so much controversy about whether the mandates were good or not. But you can see this still, we're sort of othering her. Um, and then the interview also showed a national public meeting on gangs 
and you know, a national, but it was failed to disclose that it was a national party event. And then they also stated that Hollis at 3.9% was claimed to be ahead of Gray, 3.4% at, at this time. So I'm just wondering where that came from, how that, how that cov- how that information was gathered, because we can see from um just going down quickly to look at the election results. Um, Uffendale got 11,000, Tonetti 5,000, Luxton, Cameron Luxton, apologies, Cameron, 2,000, and then Gray was next with 1,000. Um, so Hollis was two, 260. So, you know, so Gray got a third of Luxton's votes without having any cover, any positive coverage in the media. So that's, to me, that's pretty interesting too. So then the June 11 News Hub coverage occurred after Gray complained that she had been interviewed but not permitted, she'd been permitted to be seen but not heard like a good girl. So News Hub acknowledged that it was an omission not to have her voice heard. So she, she then had, she, she reported to me that it was another really good interview where they talked about, you know, the policy platform she was running on, she's walking up and down streets and Apparently, this happened in the last this last last um, interview as well. People are greeting her. People liked her, and the reporter could see that. The reporter was responding to that too, so she knew she was coming across really well. However, bef- by the time it entered um, News Hub and was you know relayed to the public, it excluded any meaningful discussion of the platform she was just talking about. And the video generically stated, you know, these minor parties each have a range of values and policies, but they are united by COVID-19. So they didn't, it, it made them others. Um, the dominant media attention was granted, granted to the anti-mandate issue and, and the potential for the minor parties to unite in the next election a year from now. So that was that was discussed. And the broadcast zeroed in on Gray calling for the extension of the vaccine rollout to teenagers. She called it government mandated genocide. So this is this is June 2022. And Gray noticed noted that genocide is an unwanted death. And of course that is a controversial statement. But as of June 2022, the, the, the scientific literature demonstrated that healthy young men were more at risk of hospitalisation and death from the injection, this the, the gene therapy, than they were of COVID-19, which, of course, is the disease following infection by SARS-CoV-2. And we know that the government did not conduct rolling literature reviews of the scientific literature to compare what the new findings were on um, the, the risk of young people um, to have myocarditis and young men especially to have myocarditis following their exposure to the injection, particularly in the short and, and, and then what would happen in immediately after rather than, you know, some month or some two weeks later. So we we know that this is this continues to be contr- controversial and it continues to be people trying to understand more of this um their their official information act requests are suppressed or sidelined or or something like that so and on that basis sue is exemplary she has extraordinary oia official information act requests has done all of that to try to hold to to high standards the government so if she were in government she would hold herself to the same high standards she expects of those people in government who are not doing that and you know, Jody, just for people now a year on from this, almost a year on from this, look around your own social circles, look around your communities, ask yourself, have you heard of young men with heart problems? And ask yourself then before the rollout of this, did you hear of young men having heart attacks? Many, many, many with heart issues. Cardiology didn't have to deal with it so and so they then they were talking about the people's register so so gray was tr- trying to talk to call attention to the people's register now we know that was that was where civil society were had struggled and they they knew that you know their, their information wasn't coming through through medsay through the standard channels and they were wanting to to understand to let people know the harm that had that had in, been incurred and so this of course was also you know taboo you you don't want that to be a public issue um so in this particular 
interview, there was no discussion by the journalists that, that we're looking at the scientific literature or we should inquire, we should do more, you know. It was all about the government policy, the government claims. So there was no curiosity um, from that journalist. And so that was quite surprising but then not surprising and again the precedent for the next election and how anyone that differs from the stated policy the accepted narrative they, they simply won't be covered in by news hub we know that and we know that by radio new zealand you know, so we, we in new zealand herald so this is this is really concerning we have an election this year very concerning. I'm going to make a statement and see what your reaction is. Without a truly free press, without a truly free fourth estate, you do not, you cannot have democracy. What's your reaction to that statement, Jody? Well, it's impossible. So, you know, we have the judiciary, which is selected by parliament. We have parliament. Then we have the administration, the officials that seem to have no capacity to challenge the desires of cabinet, which is a very small cohort of ministers. So New Zealand's democracy now, I would say, is quite precarious. And so now the latest thing, we've got five minutes um, more or so to just to talk. So Gray has degrees in law with honours, a degree in biochemistry and a degree in microbiology. I believe there's a group called FACT New Zealand, FACT Aotearoa, and FACT Aotearoa, Apparently their funding comes from a, an, a charity, but we don't know which charity it is and we don't know who the board are. We don't know anything. Um, so these are quite a mysterious group that uh, apparently are the font of all knowledge and they made a complaint to the Law Society, this is on their website, um, about what happened when a young person had myocarditis and Gray posted on social media that this what is this kind of sort of thing? And I didn't, I wasn't following that then. Um, but what is interesting to me is that um, she's up in front of the Law Society. And I don't know, if it sounds like it's, she's up on the Law Society based on not ex scientific, scientific expertise, whether myocarditis was a real issue that was being suppressed by the state. She's up based on, I think, what social media posts. Like, and I don't, so I don't know if there's any expertise, if there's any really solid evidence that can show that, that Sue was absolutely, that, that Gray was absolutely departing from the scientific knowledge back then. But we know, we know from Pfizer's own post-marketing study, we know from the scientific literature that myocarditis, and we know also from official information at the request, myocarditis was absolutely understood in June 2021 to, to be harmful. Now, this complaint was October 2021. So the temporal alignment, that was when people, when, when thousands of people were, were um, sending in submissions to the COVID amendment bill. It was the month before Hipkins, our now Prime Minister, Hipkins was about to roll out mandates to, to the entire healthy society of, of Aotearoa New Zealand that was not at risk of SARS-CoV-2. So this, the temporal, you know, alignment is pretty amazing. This is this has all come through Fact Aotearoa, November 12, 2021, the New Zealand Law Society is now investigating complaints. Now, so when I asked Gray about this, she said there's new rules governing the behaviour of lawyers with an emphasis on tackling bullying and harassment. She directed me to this website from the Law Society will come into force from the 1st of July, 2021. And I think, I believe that was after bullying that happened um, with, with lawyers. So, you know, is this them using this policy to come down on a lawyer with a science and law degree who has been one of the only independent lawyers that will talk across science and law in Aotearoa, New Zealand today, because, you know, that, that will really look at this from an independent, not representing like a, you know, a large corporation with vested interests. So she's an independent. And so then we had, so in December 2022, you know, so, so I'm looking at another article we're, we're seeing on the spin-off, you know, one of New Zealand's most prominent conspiracy theorists also happens to be a qualified lawyer. So we're seeing just, we're seeing this representation in the media that 
that is, you know, and then they've had an they've had an interview with Corin Dan here talking about this was talking about baby Will, and she's talking about the the risk in blood. And so this is a lawyer who's going into a court talking about what happens to the blood once you've got a spike protein replicating and what that that the fact that this protein is inflammatory and can, can induce clotting and and so Dan is not wanting to talk about that. He's just trusting, you know, the blood from the blood surface. They accept the truth, which, you know, where there's no risk there, you know. And so we see, you know, the spin-off just, just not really asking Gray, you know, is what is the evidence and why should you say this? They're just saying you're a, you're a conspiracy theorist and shut up, you know. She's, she's in a really important place because someone actually has to be in that place. Yes, yes. It is shocking the bias of the media. I have been contacted by quite a prominent person who would be who will be well known to a number of Kiwis who has told me that he now has full tests showing his immune system post the jabs, which he had to have for his work, he says, is producing only spike proteins. It has gone into spike protein overdrive. It's like a factory saying, I'm sorry, we can't do any other of the parts to build this car. We're only building the wheels. That's the only thing this factory now can do. He basically has AIDS, and that's from having this in his blood. And he's willing to talk to me about it. Vaccine-induced AIDS, Mm -hmm. acquired immunity deficiency. So Sue, in the fullness of time, will be absolutely vindicated. But here's the thing, Jodi. The media is putting, the mainstream media is putting these labels ahead of names to already bias the story. People contacted me after I was in court because Simon Dallow was there on TV1, conspiracy theorist Liz Gunn in court. But where's the conspiracy? I go to the source. I interview prime cases, the prime evidence. The primary evidence is someone saying, I'm injured from that jab. That has happened since the jab. You can't debate that. But it's the labelling of Sue that's doing so much damage, the labelling of people who question. Yeah, I think it's defamatory. And so if you look at misinformation, which is wrong information, and disinformation, which is distorted information, I, I could be, I could be, you know, incorrect here. But what we see from the way the media has operated, they have kept information out. So they've only showed one sort of information, which is disinformation. And then the misinformation is by the defamation and the failure to look at the heart of the matter. That is why this person or these groups are so strongly, and I I believe these groups are sort of, they seem to be saying we, we want democracy to be stronger. So what is the most amazing thing is News Hub then across We saw it on Facebook and we saw it on Twitter. I was appalled. So in this Connor Witter News Hub article, in the final sentence they they called them anti-mandate and anti-government party. So these are all the parties that say democracy is wrong. So, But what was even more disingenuous and misleading is when the thumbnail, so when you have, when you put a post up, on Facebook or Twitter, you have you don't just have the video, you put a little thumbnail deliberately at the front so it's a nice picture so people want to click on it. It's a deliberate action to put that thumbnail. They put a photograph of Sue Gray at each place with the that last sentence in that article, anti-mandate and anti-government. So they have put, they have stated, and, and when you could see the thousands of eyeballs looking across the threads on Facebook and Twitter. I mean, these the, these media institutions know exactly what they're doing. And so the question is, who are they going to do it this to in the next election? What an important talk. And I think in the future, Jodie, we'll dig deeper into this. But I want to finish with this question, and it's it's unanswerable fully at this stage. Where can we begin as a people who don't want this Americanization of New Zealand politics, who don't want this suppression of anybody but the Dems and the Republicans? And, you know, we've seen how corrupt it is over there. How can we, the people, start to prepare to take back our election? And that possibly is a whole other interview with you. But what's your initial feeling as a voter, really, more than a more than somebody who studies the sociology of it, but as a voter, how, how do you want to prepare for a fair election this time? 
Well, I, I, I guess this, this watching this process has made me want to broadly support minor parties and broadly draw attention to minor parties and perhaps think about how people in government, in business, in the social welfare and health sector and education sector, whether they, if they have good knowledge, want to approach the minor parties with their policy ideas and start to form networks around them because what I understand it's about information. It's about the information we can have. So we saw the election was about the fear, which of course induced compliance, and then it was about the hiding of science that was inconvenient and the encouraging of propaganda around accepting a brand new technology. Now we know digital technology is on its way. So we know this is being has the potential to increase surveillance and in, and incre- and reduce the autonomy of citizens and residents. So I think civil society has to start surrounding brave people that want to be voices, that want to speak up and support them in any way they can um, because we, we need as a whole to rise up because the directive, top-down, management consultancy, you know, somehow all of New, Ze- New Zealand is the first city to become a smart city country. How has this happened? Has this come from remonstrations by, you know, local families and local communities walking in to local government? It hasn't, you know. And, and you know, has everything that Labor have done, was that, have they simply stuck to their ele- election promises? So we need to talk and come together, and I believe we can do this. Absolutely. They have not stuck to their election promises. In fact, they introduced things that were wildly beyond what any of the electorate wanted. Three waters jumps out immediately, but so many, so much else in terms of legislation. There has not been a listening to the people. I would suggest, Jody, people begin by writing to our mainstream media outlets, Radio New Zealand, TV1 and TV3, and get putting them on warning now. We expect the small parties to be included in any debates. And if you don't have someone who can manage it, I'll put my hand up. I loved having 14 people on two rows and I managed to get all of them in in that debate and give it a balanced feel. Nobody had too much it can voice. Be done. It can be done easily. It's not brain surgery, you know. No, it is not. And all you do is prepare well TV1 and you get someone good to do it and you give some fairness in this election. Let's so I believe that perhaps this um the the link to this video should be shared repeatedly with the legacy media in New Zealand, but also with the new media to to help new media understand that people are understanding where it's going wrong and how it's going wrong because this is because the fourth estate is essential to democracy and um and we we simply do not have an independent fourth estate right now absolutely i quite like the idea of co chairing a debate with you the two of us at the front and we'll have everybody there i'm sure we'll have cardboard cutouts for lux and then hipkins they may not join the debate well, they should if they're wise they will they will they start should. to look at alternate media we do not want any exclusion of the major parties. We simply want greater inclusion. We want a fair and free and open democracy. And if they didn't turn up to those debates on alternate media, then they show themselves as not worthy of being voted in. That would be my final word, Jody, because democracy is about being answerable to the people who are going to vote at these polls. What we need and what we really don't have, we you know, we we don't have a town square. So we've got the shopping malls, but if you walk in with with flyers as a political party, you'll be asked to leave. And of course you can apply for permission to walk into the shopping mall, but you might not be allowed. Particularly imagine if you were talking about protecting small business because we know shopping malls today are, are chain stores. Would would you be allowed in that shopping mall if you were discussing a controversial issue that contradicted their desired goals, for example. So we don't have a town square. We need a square where the community comes. We need funding for public debate to support people who might not be able to, you know, to get to these debates to come. We need free entry to debates. We need it to be far more democratic and far more public access 
than we have. And this the debate we're having now needs to be in the mainstream. You know, we, apparently there's only certain debates we can have in the mainstream, but this is a really important one. Very, and it's been a delight talking to you as always, Jodie. I, I would say this after the next election, whoever does get in must take over Radio New Zealand and TVNZ for the people. Replace the people who have not told us the truth through this period. It's not hard to train up good journalists. You need a questioning mind, a critical thinking faculty. And then we start again with our media to uphold freedom in this country. Yeah. I, I mean, RNZ used to be my, my default Same. Solution. Um, yes. And I'm just going to say at the end of this, you can find me on J.R. Brunning, J-R-B-R-U-N-I-N-G dot substack dot com. Just a little plug to find me because sometimes you, you can't. I'm talking risk on Twitter. Brilliant. And also look at Silence, the wonderful documentary, which we'll link under here. Jody, delightful to talk to you as always, stimulating. And I think there's further to investigate from this discussion. Let's see what the feedback is like, what questions people have having watched this. Thank you, Jody Brunning. Thank you very much.